So getting into more so style of play. Um, and I've taken this obviously from Basketball New South Wales on their pace, poison, penetration. And just to give you, I guess, some examples and how I would, I guess, go about teaching this or looking at this and going, well, if this is the state, I guess, overall arching philosophy on how you want to play on offense is pace, poise, penetration. Well, breaking those three things down to how do you teach pace? How do you teach your team to be a, a fast break transition team? And that might be five on O transition. It might be two on one fast break, three on two fast break. Uh, teaching them how to play in that fast pace, you know, putting eight seconds on a shot clock and having them play full court and they have to try and score within the eight seconds or 10 seconds, whatever it may be. But you have to actually, if you say that that's a priority for you, that you want to pay with, play with pace, is how do you actually like teach that? What drills you can actually put into place to have that? Uh, and the third thing would be is how much time you spend on, on that at practice. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm big on it now because I, I hear myself talk to coaches or, or coaches that say, when I ask them, say, you know, what is your philosophy? How do you like to play? You know, and everyone wants to play in transition because it's, it's more fun. You get to score more points. You're going to play quick. And I always like to say, how much time do you actually incorporate fast break basketball or transition basketball into your practice plan? Because you can say that I want to be a fast paced team, but you don't actually practice it at practice. You don't give any time to it. So then how can your team be good in transition or fast break basketball if you're not actually allowing time in practice to devote to that? And I think that's the number one thing is like when you start to define what your philosophy is, is to find then how much time you're prepared to spend on those things like at practice. You know, um, how to teach poise. So if you want to be a poise team, some examples would be, you know, you'd put, you know, four offense against five defenders to have to make them play against multiple defenders where they have to play with poise, with better decision-making. Give them, you know, a shot clock where they actually have to score in the last eight seconds and not score in the first 16 seconds. See if they can play poised and be able to move the ball, make good decisions, keep good spacing and get the best shot possible. And how do you incorporate that in like part of your practice in about, you know, as I said, like doing drills where it may be they've got to score within a certain amount of time within the shot clock and it's got to be in the last eight or you're actually overloading with defense. So the offense has got to feel some pressure and play more poise and still get the best shot that they can. You know, or it might be within a team of younger players, every player has got to touch the ball before they can score. So they're playing with that poise of sharing the ball, moving the ball, and they're playing at a better tempo or a better place pace. I guess, and the last one on the on the basketball New South Wales style of play is is penetration. So how do you teach teams to to penetrate or attack and drive the basket? Well, you've got to play with like great spacing. So if your offense has got to allow to have great spacing to have driving lanes but it's also going back to teaching the players how to drive to the basket. Do they have the, the correct angles? Are they driving like wide in a banana angle? Are they going like direct to the basket? Can they play off two feet? Do they play off one feet when they're driving? Are their eyes up? The appropriate decision. Is it a layup? Is it a kick out pass? Or is it stop, pump fake, shoot the ball? So teaching them how to drive and the finishing on the end of it and teaching them when to drive. Obviously, if somebody's in the driving lane, you're not going to drive or there's no space to go back to. And then ultimately, on the end of it, why are you driving? Are you driving its the last eight seconds to try and get to the basket to get your score? Are you driving because that's a, a scout like the other team's not good on closeouts? Is it something where you've got an advantage one-on-one -on -one where you've got a quicker player and you want them to drive to the basket? So it's all those thinking about why you're teaching stuff, how you're going to teach it, and then getting the players' feedback on the why they're doing it or why you're playing in that sort of style of play to get feedback and to get buy-in by your players. 
that I think it's important that, you know, even going back to coaching under 12s, under 14s, having conversations about what they see, how they feel, giving direction into this is what we value and this is the style that we want to play. On the defensive side of things with basketball New South Wales, the number one is like be disruptive. And so my thoughts on that are like, how, how do you be disruptive? You know, you got to get it, you got to have ball pressure, you got to have get in the passing lanes, teach them how to pressure the ball. How do they get in a passing lane? Is it back foot denial? Is it front foot denial that you're going to cause them to go back door? Is it disruptive on and off the ball? Like because some teach, people teach that they just want to be disruptive off the ball and then everyone else can be in pack stance. So it's just getting that fine line of how you want to like teach that and how that flows over into your team's practice-like sessions. Um, did an interesting uh, thing last week. I was invited in uh, to do a session with the COE Women's Program, and it was like just a session on about disruptive defense and pressure defense. Uh, and it was great from a perspective of the defense had full-blown ability to be able to pressure the ball, pressure passing lanes, go and trap any pass, whether it be side, baseline, go and like trap the post. And it was interesting from that point of view that the defense was like so great, but the offense became so bad because they weren't used to dealing with that amount of like pressure that they became turnovers, they became poor shots, they became people who couldn't even catch the ball and handle the ball. And I think that's an important thing of like having one style is okay. So if you want to be a disruptive team, that's fine. But then on the other hand, how do you actually be a conservative team that may need to like just contain the ball and not be full of pressure? So I think that you've got to have your identity, but you've also got to keep an eye on what might else you need to do to change up how you need to play if the game needs a change in defense. Being disciplined is obviously important and talk a whole lot um, with my team that like I coached about discipline as far as discipline in blow buys, discipline in closing out, discipline in their hand pressure, um, discipline in boxing out, um, and disciplined in not fouling. Because I think that's something that we let, uh, or I let as coaches, we, we let go a whole lot of fouling at practice. And that causes kind of like you get to a game and wonder why people or you end up with your team in, in five team fouls in the first two or three minutes. So it's those habits that you create about being disciplined at your practice. How you're going to do it is, you know, penalties for fouls, penalties for blow buys, penalties, you know, if they haven't got like hand pressure. And I think that you've got to build up of like what things you're going to actually allow and what things are non-negotiables within your practice session and within your philosophy that if your teams aren't doing it, what's going to be a non-negotiable and what is the consequence if they're not actually following like that instruction. And obviously the last one is like be aggressive. So if you want to be a disruptive team, you've got to be aggressive. How do we be aggressive? Once again, with like out fouling. I think that's an important part is you can be aggressive but what's to the point where you're so aggressive that you create offense for the other team. So there's a fine line about being a disruptive team, but also being able to be disciplined within being disruptive that you're not going to give people backdoor cuts or backdoor layups, but also allowing blow buys and points in the paint. So I think about with the style of play and philosophy is thinking about how that relates to you and like your coaching. And then also how your philosophy then creates and feeds into your practice plan and what you do as far as your planning like of practice, because it's something that I think you should always go back to is say, if mine was pace, poise, penetration, those three pillars I'd want to touch on every practice session. There'd be, have to be some form of that. If that was my style and that was my philosophy that I'd want to be touching on every time at practice. So moving on from that, so that's the style of, of play into planning practice. And regardless, um, just my thoughts going from under 12s to, to WNBL level, we still do part of 
all of our practice sessions, there is a part of fundamentals, there's a part of skill-based individual like learning and team learning. And that's the part between, you've got to give enough time, I think, for the athletes to be able to develop their skills. And I know for, for most of you, you'd be probably have one hour a week, maybe you know two one hour sessions a week for practice. And it's really difficult to try and fit everything in. So I think that there's got to be that fine line between skill development and individual development within your practice sessions versus team development, team style of play. I think you can kind of either go one way or the other and it's usually the individual development goes out the window because you want to scrimmage, you want to play the five on five because you've got your team together. But the, the individuals need to be able to have the skills to play in whatever style that you have, whether it's ball handling, passing, shooting. So I think there's got to be a balance between skill and individual work plus obviously like team development and team structures. Within your practice session drills for purpose, because we all are usually like time poor, we have an hour, an hour and a half, what are your drills that can actually relate to your practice session and to the things that you wanna get out of that? So for example, having a, having a drill that sets out a specific purpose for the end result that you're trying to get, not just, I guess, rolling out and doing three man weave, for the sake of doing a three-man weave? Does it have purpose to how you want to play or how, or it's a skill-based thing that you want to practice passing? But to me, what are, you, what are you trying to get out of like each drill? What is the actual content? What is actually going to be fed back to the players about a drill has got to be purposeful for the athletes to one, be challenged, two, be able to individually improve their skill level or help your team in whatever skill area that they need. Uh, the second, uh, the fourth one, concepts breakdown of offense and defense. And like, I don't mind whatever style people run, whether it's flex, whether it's shuffle, whether it's motion, being able to find time within your practice session to isolate and break down little parts and components of your offense. So whether it might be, you know, post passing triangle, just to work on like post feeding, it might be, you know, you're using, you know, a turnout or a floppy cut within your offense, breaking that down three on three. So the athletes are actually getting the breakdown parts of their offense about we might be using screens, whether it's pick and roll, using a turnout, um, using a, a shuffle cut, using a flex cut and whatever it may be, but getting concepts and breakdowns and then going and putting it in holes. So doing that breakdown and then actually going and putting it in holes so they actually get to see a small part of it that they can be successful in and then actually go and scrimmage it and work that over and over. And I think that's an important way of being able to play in practice is finding time to do little breakdown drills that you can actually spend at two baskets so they're getting more repetition. And obviously, if you've got assistant coaches that you can, you can spend at each basket and you're getting more reps than what you would by just standing there going five on five at one basket. Now, there's always got to be a component of scrimmage at practice um, and how you might use, I guess, stats at practice. And I'm not, I'm not overly big um, of stats just purely because of at practice, at least, just purely because of time frames. And I have, like, like you guys would have, we all have jobs and I have assistant coaches that have full-time jobs. But how you incorporate some of those stats at practice. So if we go back to our style of play, if we wanted to be a pace team and we were scrimmaging, one stat might be, well, just statting how many layups that you get in the first eight seconds of your practice session or while you're scrimmaging. You know, if you want to be a disruptive defensive team, when you're scrimmaging, have someone take stats about how many steals you might get or how many deflections you get. So then that's feedback to the athletes that's actually reinforcing your style of play and how you want to play the game. So I think that there's a small amount of time that you can actually like use some stats for definite feedback to the players during practice session. And I usually take those stats during a scrimmage session rather than, I guess, a drill. And the last point here is practice goals and having a plan. I think you've always got to sit down and like, what is the purpose 
or what, what do you want to get out of like the practice? And I sit there and kind of break down maybe one offensive goal that I'll relay to the players that that's the goal for that practice session offensively. What's the goal defensively and, and what's the general goal? And a general goal might be, you know, boxing out. It might be communication and talk, something like that. So it's just having one, one or two clear goals for practice that I always say to the group beforehand, here's our focus on offense for the day. Here's our focus on defense. Here's something general. Regardless of the whole practice session, these, that's one thing that we're trying to, to focus on for either the week or that practice session. Um, and going into a, a practice plan, as I spoke about, is like, what is the goal or the emphasis of the session? And I think that's the number one thing that you, you start with before you actually delve into how you actually want to plan your practice. And this is something that kind of like, I guess, I do um, with the CAPS and how I formulate, I guess, our practice sessions is definitely, you know, what's the emphasis of the practice session? And I'm happy to share, like after I finished here, an example or two of our of um, my practice sessions with the caps. But always, you know, regardless, and this is regardless whether we have one session a week, five sessions a week, there is all a part of you know ball handling, passing, and finishing uh, within um, our practice session. Once again, going back to there's got to be an element for me always of skill development within our practice session. And usually tying that into the warm up is where I try and get the first part of practice is more skill work, individual work, and then build it up into our teamwork. So then there's always an element of two on one, three on two, because I think that leads into decision making, all those things, ball handling, passing, finishing, all the things that we've worked on previously. And sometimes that might be um, in the full court. Sometimes it might be in the half court. Um, just making decisions like in transition, making decisions in the half court, whether that's two on one, three on two, four on three. Um, we even do sometimes in the, in the half and full court. Then we always go into small sided games and breakdowns. So small sided games might be three on three, might be four on four in breaking down some of the concepts like of our offense that we want to break down. So it might be two on two pick and roll, it might be three on three working like out of a turnout. It might be um, sometimes just four on four, just playing without any part or any structure of our game. Because I think sometimes we, we coach our offense so much, but if we took stats about how much we actually just score out of our offense versus score out of our broken play, I think we don't do enough, or like for, especially for me, don't do enough in coaching broken play situations because sometimes you don't always get the perfect score or the score you want out of your offense is it where do you get those scores out of broken play and sometimes that's just letting them play five on five without your structure five on four four on three four on four with where you might get an offensive rebound it's back out and it's skelter or you finished your play and you haven't got the score or the shot that you wanted and then obviously it's always, there's a component of practice about scrimmaging. And the last one about communication and listening, there's always components of that, whether that be through feedback when the girls go and get a drink, feedback through having a quick timeout during practice, practicing having like a timeout to practice them listening uh, and then being able to then communicate to the group, even being able to, I, I think in juniors, it's, it's kind of fun and important if you give one kid a piece of information to take back to the group about how that is then developed within your group and about how they listen and how they communicate back from what you're saying to the players. Uh, defensively, um, always do some stuff on one on zero, one on one with our, our stance and our hand pressure um, and containment because I think that's a, a really important part of I think Australian basketball that we need to, to get better at is the first two points is one-on-one -on -one containment and one-on-one -on -one closeout. So I think is some, an area that I've seen over the course of time. And I, I would even put our Opals into that. Um, we're poor closing out. We can be poor one-on-one -on -one defenders at times. So there's always an element of that in practice where there is literally nowhere to hide. You either get scored on or you get a stop. 
uh, and it comes down to what you, how you want to manage that. And once again, what your emphasis is defensively. We always do a, at least 10, 15 minutes on, on shell drill and rotation defense like at practice. Uh, there's always a part of defensive transition because that drives me nuts and I think I might be one of the worst coaches at like teaching D-trans because my teams are always all over the place no matter how much repetition and drill work we do and I think it's like something that we can always get better at and then you know on the other side where I spoke about offensive concepts and then defending different concepts of play so defending pick and rolls defending a a shuffle cut, a flex cut, a flare screen, a stagger screen, and being able to break different concepts down and giving players the tools to be able to defend those concepts. Small-sided games, being able to play like three-on-three, four-on-four in those areas, and then scrimmage. And then obviously, yet again, is like I'm big on the whole communication and listening part is a huge part to me. Um, so I guess that's how... I guess when I break down like our practice session for the caps and how I used to do it when I was like at the center of excellence, I would always think about, you know, what the emphasis was for the, for the session for either that practice session or for the week. Uh, we might've had like a weekly goal um, and you might like change some of these. Obviously that's a lot to get through. And we practice for an hour and a half, two hours. There might be something that you place more emphasis on for that week and take something else out. But I think it gets back to having that plan and making sure you've got the drills within that. And I would say um, within the drills that you use for your teams, there's nothing wrong in having drills that are great repetition drills that the players know that, right, we're in this. You don't have to go back and spend time reteaching. That it might be, you know, everyone should know, all right, shell, four and four shell drill gets two stops in a row. They shouldn't have to go back to, all right, we need to have ball pressure. We need to be in the passing lane. There's those kind of drills. We have a drill with the girls that we call it like Spurs drill and we have a quadrants drill. So as soon as I say it now, they know what we're in. They know what to do. There's no actually like teaching or highlighting of it. And you can get through it quicker with repetitions. You're not having to teach a new drill every practice session. So you should have, a, I guess, a backlog of favorite drills that you have and give them names so that the players know so you're not having to reteach, I guess, a new drill each time that you go to practice, that there's some favourites that you have in there. I always kind of like the ones that they moan and complain about, I like to roll out more often. So the ones that they like, teach them when you, you want to teach them, ones that they moan and complain about, do them more often because obviously they're the ones that they don't like. Okay, um, I guess my last one is... If you want to become a good coach, you'll have to first develop your, your coaching philosophy and that fits your personality and teaching methods. And I think it's, it's okay for you to be you. You know, I don't, you know, I've tried and I, I go along and I like watch different coaches and you can always, I guess, learn something, whether it's X's and O's, whether it's how they manage their team, how they communicate, um, what system, what style but I don't think you ever want to be somebody that just tries to be somebody else. Because I think that you need to be comfortable in your own skin and coach in the style and the game style and philosophy that suits your personality. Because eventually the players will see through it. And then I'll always say when the shit, it's a fan, you got to have like the answers and you've got to be the one to front. So you've got to be comfortable in your own personality and how you want to play, how you want to like teach and how what philosophy, I guess, fits in with your style. I guess each coach has a, their own way of running their team. And obviously, like on this, there'll be coaches that coach from under 12 to under 16. Is you are the best ones to, I guess, evaluate your teams and what they need and what they, I guess, need to improve, improve at. And you've got to get that, I think. Another thing that we do as far as we have the team practice, we have the practice plan, you know best within your group what they need to what they need to get to, but it's how you I guess evaluate post games and how you evaluate post practice is also like important that you can always I guess evaluate what could have been like done better at practice, get some feedback for the players 
what did you like? What didn't you like about practice? Did you like that drill? Why didn't you like it? Because I think getting feedback from them, sometimes we think we have all the answers or we think the know-how all the time. And sometimes it's important just as much as we want athletes to communicate and listen, sometimes we need to be able to like listen to like their feedback as well. Be prepared to be flexible in that, just as what I, like I said, if something's like not working, be prepared to change tack to go in a different like direction that not some way is your way always the right way. There's times to, I guess, be flexible going both ways. Um, and whatever your coaching style is, is like do it, do it with passion and do it with fun. Because I think that's the most important thing. We all want to get something out of it, but we want to make sure that the kids are enjoying practice, that they're going to get something out of there, enjoying their games, they're enjoying the environment that you create. And that's how we keep players in this game is if the coach is coaching with passion, they're up and about and they've got lots of juice and energy that's going to feed back like into like, I guess the players, because I always say the players are number one. It's not about like the coach. It's not about our jobs or our egos. It's about doing the right thing by the players in teaching them and helping them become the best players that they can be. Um, and, you know, I think it's going back to that, that point about being flexible is within practice plans, you know, you, you may not get through everything. You may be stuck on like one thing. It's that time thing of you to decide whether you move on, stick with it, leave it to it like another day. And that's where I guess we can't be set in stone that this is how it's always going to happen because there's going to be different variables within your group about how they learn, how quickly they can learn um, and how quickly you can get through what you've got. Okay. Can you see that one? We can see that now, mate. Yeah. So this was, I guess I'll show you another one as well, but this was like, I guess leading into, you'll see, as I've saved it, this was like leading into, I think it was uh, semi-final three against Melbourne. And so literally, obviously we had video warm up shooting, our pick and roll shooting, like it's a little series that we always do at least twice a week and the same thing. It's a drill that we do that the girls know how to come in and do. Four and four shell drill and all the highlighted parts are, I guess, keys for me in the practice drill about what we're trying to, to get better at on my keys and points of emphasis. So within the shell drill, obviously my, my key and emphasis was having hand pressure, stunting and boxing out. Um, you know, in the half court, so that's five on five half court, like here versus horns, we were practicing uh, three-way switching. Um, in the full court, when Melbourne went middle pick and roll, we were icing the pick and roll, um, just different things. And here in the yellow is we were practicing, I guess, some of Melbourne's offensive structures and they were, those were our defensive cues. But we wanted to push the ball sideline we wanted to have you know, a good catch spot on the screen or about being point of the screen, where our low help was fit, where our ball side corner man was positioned, where our opposite wing was making sure that they were sitting across on the low post. Um, the blue bit here is just our play calls. Um, and then we just did some you know, five on five scrimmage out of zone offense and defense, baseline out of bounds versus zone. But you can see here down the bottom in the green is that was my emphasis for the, the practice session is defense was defensive transition with hand pressure, our post D, getting a body on box out, making sure there were no easy catches and being disruptive and assertive. And then offensively, about transition offense, getting short, quick passes to get the ball out. If they're in zone, driving versus the zone and getting to second side actions, attacking the basket. And then obviously getting a big on the rings, slipping screens. So that's